So yeah, this is about the Chris session. Um, so I'm Chris Leonard Smith. I'm, I'm at JPL. We're doing this in collaboration with um, Jane Nadeau at Portland State. She's the lead there, and the uh, Garib Lab at Caltech. I'm actually going to talk about a little more than hol holographic microscopy. Here's a bunch of people over the years who've worked with us, and some of the people are new uh, who didn't contribute necessarily to this, but we've got a lot going on, and so there's a lot um, that will be reported in other areas. Um, so background, I think um, Allison and Richard covered pretty well why we want to do imaging. One thing I want to highlight here is a quote from the 65 paper by Lovelock, where everybody likes to quote that for um, talking about the looking for chemical structure, but he also pointed out imaging is a really important way for us to detect extant life somewhere. And the problem in 1965 was that cameras were awful. Um, the laser was a couple years old, the CCD hadn't been invented yet, the laser diode was a couple years old. Um, we have all those things now and they're very cheap and we can take advantage of those. Um, so what we want to do with imaging is, um, down here is, there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can see with electron microscopy and AFM, uh, but it's not that great for search because you've got this tiny, tiny volume of view. So with optical microscopy, you can look in the 100 nanometer out to, say, a micron or even tens of micron range, depending on your instrument. And typical microscopes that you see in the lab, if you're just a microbiologist, have a volume of view that's really tiny. So if you're looking for something that's 100 per milliliter, you have to look at a lot of slides before you get anywhere. Um, we've built a microscope called Ishmael, um, icy surface holographic microscope for analysis of European life um, that has a very huge volume of view. It's a millimeter thick at full submicron resolution, and that's our holographic microscope. Um, we also have fluorescence that we've added to it that I'm going to talk about. So here's the summary of the whole thing up front. Uh, we've combined two microscopes. We've got a holographic microscope here. It does high resolution imaging at submicron. Um, we're looking at a volume a millimeter thick by a half millimeter by a half a millimeter. And one of the restrictions of holography is that you can't really do fluorescence with it because we depend on coherent light to do that. So we wanted to do fluorescence. We wanted to be able to do stains and do chemical lit, um, labeling of cells. So what we did is we put in a beam splitter and we're using the same objectives in the same field of view and we've added another microscope. It's a light field microscope that um, looks at exactly the same thing at the same time but we can look at all the fluorescence or we can look at things for just color if we want to look for pigments if we have a color camera back here. And both of these are compressive techniques where a single hologram or a single light field image captures everything that's in that volume at the full resolution of the system. Um, we've sacrificed resolution in the light field because um, of features of light field microscopy, but we've got that all, all that resolution here. And then um, we, from the single image, we get chemical composition or we can get um, structure and optical properties um, from time series, we can get cellular chemistry. As things change, you could do flim, or we can do mass, density, and activity from time series. We can extract all those things. So how the holographic microscope works, um, it looks a lot like a regular microscope. So we've got a light source. Uh, we've got a lens here um, that's an objective lens. We've got our sample. Um, and then we've got a detector back here. And we really use very simple objectives back here because we. Um, are using monochromatic light. We don't have to have all the chromatic aberration correction. Then we have a second beam that we use as a clock, basically. We just put water in there, and we get an interference pattern back here. So our second beam hasn't gone through anything but water. Same path length, so we know exactly how long it should have taken to go through here. The sample that we're looking at, whether it's got bugs or rocks or something in it, um, has been perturbed by the sample, and we can back propagate to figure out what was in the sample. So we take some Fourier transforms, we multiply by a phase factor, and we can reconstruct an amplitude image that's just like a regular picture. Or we can reconstruct a phase image that we don't have a sort of classical analog for, but what it is is essentially the thickness of the sample times the index of refraction difference between the sample and the medium. And so we can combine these. It's basically um, all of the electric field is captured in here. We can combine these into any form of image we want without having to put any stains in. Um, the catch is we don't get the chemistry out. Things we can do with that, we can do structure, amoeba from a pond, we get diatoms. Um, we can do intensity and phase images of various things. We can look at things over time. So this is a one micron particle being tracked for several seconds. Um, we've got a huge dynamic range. So this is a, he just ran away, he's coming back here. A huge diatom is about 40 microns long. And then over here is like a little one micron thing swimming around in there. So all of this is just a single reconstruction plane. 
all of the other stuff that's moving in there, we can reconstruct from the same holograms or the same hologram time series and get all of those things that are in that um, volume in that time and track them. So here's an example of Brownian motion. We um, basically have buoyant cells that are non-modal. They just kind of bounce around. They don't do much. Um, we've got one micron alumina beads. They just sink like rocks, which you kind of expect. And then we've got actual swimming um, bacteria that are the same size as these, and they go all over the place. And you can see a little corkscrew here that I pulled one out, um, but they swim like crazy. Uh, we also can get refractive index information to tell things apart. So you can tell E. coli from alumina here uh, because of the index of refraction difference. It's 1.3 versus 1.8, um, and they're indicated there. Um, we've got a biofilm um, where you can barely tell anything from the amplitude picture, um, but from the phase picture, you can tell that um, these big crystals that turned out they actually stained when they stained them um, as looking like they were alive. They're actually sulfur by the index of refraction, and they had actually spent a year trying to figure out whether they were alive or potentially alive or not before they tried a DHM um, index method on them. And even submicron things, we can sort of tell what's going on. Uh, we've got alumina particles here and air-filled vesicles here, and you can tell them apart. They're both well below the resolution limit of the microscope. And to segue into this, for unresolved objects, we can actually do modeling of the diffraction pattern um, using discrete dipole approximation um, to get out the geometry, say spherical or oblate spheroid or hexagonal or like a pill like a bacterium, and get the index of refraction and the geometry at the same time. So we get a lot of information, even about things that we can't image directly, but we can tell her there. Yeah. Um, light field is an interesting technique. Um, one of the penalties is you sacrifice um, angular resolution as you get depth of field from it. And so that's why we gave up resolution to um, get the fluorescence imaging. But what it does is instead of putting a detector right at the focus, um, you put a lenslet array here and then you put a detector behind that. And what happens is you can tell the angle at which every ray came through the system and then track backwards to figure out where the particle was. So if you've got something that was in focus, it shows up as a spot at the center. If you've got this particle back here, it shows up as these little spots at the outside of the little lenslet arrays. If it was at the same distance in front, it would be in the same lenslet arrays, but it would be on the insides um, because of the way the rays go through the system. And so we can back all that out and we can figure out where something came from. So we can associate the fluorescence from something that's reduced resolution with the high resolution image from the holographic microscope. And so here's an example of both together. Here's the whole system laid out on benchtop. Um, it's basically two microscopes side by side, connected by a couple beam splitters. And um, we've actually got it mounted up on a vertical system, so it looks like a microscope, but it photographs better when it's laying down because you don't have all the whole lab stuff behind it. Um, here's pictures from uh, Max's talk from Tuesday. If you have a time machine, you can go see his talk. Um, so here's the raw detector output of Euglena if you're looking at the system with Euglena at the focus, and then the reconstruction. Um, it doesn't look that much different, but when they're 100 microns out of focus, you can barely tell that they're there. Um, if you do the reconstruction, you can see them swimming all over here, and you get the reconstruction there. Here's combined output of the two systems. Um, the green is just the background from the DHM, and we've got resolved um, particles, and then we put pink blobs on top that came out of the um, light field system. And so we can add stains, just like Richard talked about, um, to detect things like lipids or proteins or nucleic acids. And everybody, as he said, has their favorite stains for um, picking their favorite things. We've packaged up the DHM into a Europa lander size package. Um, this fits into the 2U, basically a two liter volume. Um, and to make it uh, work with the light field, we'd probably have to add a second tube about this big um, and a little bit of stuff off the side or off the angle um, like that. And multi-wavelength is a feature we also can do. Um, one artifact of our laziness in um, not having beam splitters in the holo holographic microscope. Um, so the first microscope I showed is just any pair of these is just like that is. So what we do is we just put three different holographic microscopes at different angles. Um, we put a color filter in front of each one, and we leave the central hole bare, um, combine three lasers together, and what we get is a set of fringes that are crossed at um, 120 degree angles. 
when we Fourier transform that, each color shows up separately in the Fourier plane. So we can do a reconstruction of each different um, wavelength completely independently, overlay them on each other, and then we've got um, nice color images of Euglena using a monochromatic sensor and three lasers. And that gives us nice redundancy too. You could lose a laser, you don't lose that much information. Um, here's a movie at the bottom. I think I hit it autoplay. Um, but yeah, you can see them swimming around. And, and you can see their little eye spot. Um, here's the eye spot. They've got a little nucleus there and a nucleolus. So you can get a lot out of it. Um, future work. Um, Field implementation with the compact, compact lensless version I didn't talk about. Um, oh, and that's what we're doing now. I should have edited that out. Sample delivery system, um, Nato Borney, I don't know if he's in here hiding somewhere. Yeah, he raised his hand back there. He's working on the sample delivery. And I think it mostly works at this point, and he's going to demonstrate it in the field in about a month. Um, onboard autonomous data classification, we've got a group at JPL working on that. Because as you can tell from the videos, we can take way more data than we could possibly send home. So we have to have something to evaluate what's the best data to send home. Um, super resolution with fancy dyes. Um, polarization, we can add um, full polarization measurements, basically using the same technique as we're doing for the um, multi-wavelength. Um, and one of the point I want to make is that um, we only need about 40 microliters of sample through the system in order to get sensitivity down to about 100 particles per milliliter, which is in the um, requirement for the Europa lander. Um, other thing, no moving parts. Um, basically, we wanted to have it as simple as possible. Uh, building flight hardware is a big pain. The more moving parts you have, the bigger a pain it is. And it's also got very loose alignment requirements. Uh, so I think that's about it. And I just want to leave you with this slide. We're having an imaging workshop for life detection at the end of August at Ann Arbor with uh, Nilton Reno. So. Any questions for Chris? Yeah. Um, speak, speak loud. Okay. Um, I suppose you will do the, perform the multiple sample uh, measurement. And uh, what about uh, if the cleaning is uh, incomplete? What, uh, does this make any problem for your homogeneity? Well, um, so for Europa, you're going to get three samples from about the same place. So we don't worry that much about cross-contamination between them. Um, we can do a blank, so it, after you flush, if there's anything stuck there, um, one of the nice features of doing everything numerically is that you can remove everything numerically. And so anything that's a static error, we can basically um, just take a picture of and then subtract in post. Um, one of the things that we've been sort of moving towards as uh, we do all this work is we're finding out that the actual optics matter less and less and less, the better your computer is. Um, that you can have almost a bare detector and as long as you can get photons onto it, you can get a nice image out of it. Thank you. Excellent.